In this episode of The Omega Beam, my spoiler-free review of the movie The Kid Who Would Be King. Full speed ahead. The Omega Beam. The Omega Beam. Welcome to The Omega Beam, episode 32. I'm your host, Oren Merton, and it's been a while since the last episode. It's, it's been busy around here. So in that time that we've been busy, we have still been seeing movies and watching TV, and those things will turn into episodes of the Omega Beam in time. But for now, I wanted to talk about a smaller movie. So Glass, for example, in the United States is like the number one movie or whatever. So I don't feel like that needs a immediate podcast or anything. But The Kid Who Would Be King is another movie that's only been out less than two weeks not doing quite as well. It's a smaller movie, but definitely one worth talking about. So that is going to be the subject of this episode. Let's get going. The Kid Who Would Be King was written and directed by Joe Cornish, who also uh, wrote and directed Attack the Block, which got a lot of praise and was a hit in its native Britain, as well as uh, got some really positive marks here in the USA. And so his second movie, The Kid Who Would Be King, I believe is a joint uh, British-American film. It certainly has a larger budget than Attack the Block did. Although, again, this is a smaller movie. Larger budget does not mean Avengers-level hundreds of millions of dollars. We're talking about a $59 million movie, which sounds like a huge lump sum, and in and of itself it is, but compared to a $250 million movie, $59 million, you know, is, is significantly lower. So don't expect... Avengers spectacle or the kind of scope of intergalacticness of whatever. This is a smaller movie. It's a labor of love. It's a fairy tale that uses Arthurian legends to tell a modern story. And I think it does it really, really well. I mean, the critics seem to agree as well. Um, So I think it's worth sort of focusing on this movie for a while, because it is one that you might not hear about just out if you're looking at what's, you know, top of the charts or whatever. So this movie uses Athorian legends to basically say that chivalry and honesty and bridging our differences and not giving up and being determined were sort of ancient values that we need to bring back to our modern world. And this is not a political movie. This isn't about right or left or liberal, conservative, whatever. It doesn't espouse a, a, any kind of political party or whatever, but it's sort of political in the best way in that it doesn't talk about any policy issues. It just talks about that we as people, we need to get along better. We need to f- become leaders with compassion, determination, chivalry, and all of that stuff. And so the the sort of plot of the movie, without giving any spoilers, is that because things are so bad in the world right now, the idea is that all of this chaos has unleashed this ancient Arthurian evil into the world. This young boy, Alex, who is played by Louis Ashborn Circus, and if the name sounds familiar, it's because, yep, it's uh, Andy Circus, who was in Black Panther and The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit and does all this mocap stuff for genre movers. So this is this is his son. And he finds Excalibur. And that means that this kid is suddenly the one who has to basically get his act and his friend's act together and stop this Arthurian evil from rising in Britain. He, he doesn't do this alone. He does this with Merlin. And Merlin is played incredibly well by a younger actor uh, whose name is Angus Imry. I really hope I pronounced that right. And he splits the part because Merlin is young, for uh, parts of the movie, but then he reverts to his sort of 
natural, older, wizardly look sometimes, and that is Sir Patrick Stewart. And the two do a really good job of sort of maintaining the same character and attitude and mannerisms. It's just, they they play it really well. And this is a movie with real stakes, and the kids are in, in jeopardy, and, and it, it does... You know, this is aimed at at, at uh, sort of tweens and teens and, and kids, but this might be a little bit scary for the youngest kids. The different actors do a wonderful job of portraying the stakes while at the same time maintaining a lightness and a sense of humor in this movie that I think really is what helps helps you sort of swallow the medicine with all the humor and everything else. Not that there's any medicine, but, you know, the drama, the, the, the hard drama. And these are kids who are not rich kids. They're not I- entitled kids, and they have a lot to overcome. You know, they're not the best kids in, in the world, you know, and, and they have their own, their own arcs to deal with. So, you know, Alex has to get over, you know, his broken family and, and what his – sort of feelings of it are. And, uh, you know, Lance, who is played by an actor named Tom Taylor, is sort of a bully. I mean, he's not, you know, a heroic character. He's a bully. And he has to get over that. Um, uh, Alex has this friend named named, uh, Betters. And he's sort of your... If I may use a, a Yiddish term, he's a nebbish kid. You know, he just sort of – nothing ever goes right. He doesn't really do anything right. But he's all loyalty and he has good ideas. And he has to basically find inner strength. And uh, Kay, uh, the the girl who's played by Rihanna Doris, uh, you know, I, I have to say I'm not crazy about her arc. She's a good character, but – she is she sort of begins as just attached to the hip of Lance. So the effects are fine. They do leave something to be to be desired. Um that was Golden's main criticism of the film that the big bad, which is a CGI monster, doesn't look sort of as as uh textured and frightening and everything as you would get in a movie with a bigger budget. And that's true. Um, So in some ways, maybe this movie was a little bit more ambitious than its limited budget. But you know what? It doesn't matter because it's a great story. It's well acted. The effects are absolutely good enough. So anyway, I highly recommend this movie. It has a sweet, good message. If you've got uh, kids that are, you know, maybe a little bit older, um, the same as I, I'd say the same for this, as I said, for a previous uh, movie that you can catch in the back episodes, A House with a Clock in Its Walls, which also was a great spooky movie for kids. But the 10-year-old next to us really loved it. But maybe younger than that, I don't know, maybe it's a little intense. So same with um, with this. You know, The Kid Who Would Be King is a great movie. Take your kids and you will love it too as an adult. I think it's worth supporting films, you know, little art films for only $59 million. But seriously, this is a genre in which movies cost a lot of money and – I think we need to support those that are made for less and made well for less. So those are my thoughts on The Kid Who Would Be King. And that's it for this episode. You can find the show notes at theomegabeam.com forward slash 32. If you like this episode, please leave a review in the Apple Podcasts app or iTunes, wherever you listen to podcasts. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions for panels or other things you'd like us to cover, please drop me a line at info at theomegabeam.com. Be good to yourselves and each other, and I'll catch you next time. (laughs) ¶¶